so it's uh it's it's good to be out in the wild um all right i'm gonna talk about fluctuation force or fluctuation phenomena more generally on many body atomic systems and as nicole very nicely introduced this map of quantum thermodynamics um where she pointed to the I believe it was city state of stochastic quantum thermodynamics or something along those lines. In uh, wherein you know you study non-equilibrium dynamics of uh, typically small or quantum uh, systems, fluctuation theorems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I uh, am principally a resident of the neighborhood municipality, which is uh, one of uh, well QED and what we uh, in, in um, more, uh, let's say, uh, in relation to stochastic quantum thermodynamics, the kinds of ideas uh, that we study are uh, those of fluctuational quantum electrodynamics, okay? Where we talk about quantized electromagnetic fields in the presence of boundary conditions um, and how these, uh, how these quantum and thermal fluctuations of electromagnetic fields can lead to forces, dissipation, and other uh, fluctuation-induced phenomena. Uh, this also touches on ideas such as radiative heat transfer, which very well would fall under uh, thermodynamics. And, and these two areas intersect um, on several occasions, principally, uh, you know, they talk about quantum and thermal fluctuation effects. And they are both relevant to nanoscale quantum systems and quantum systems uh, more at large. And of course, uh, there's, you know, given that we uh, share these underlying physical phenomena, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for um, crosstalk between different areas. And uh, for one, you know, you can always look at quantum fluctuation forces from the perspective of thermodynamics, and we can perhaps borrow some intuitions uh, from one to the other. And that's uh, the purpose of you know, what I, I uh, hope to do uh, here. Okay, having said that, uh, quantum uh, fluctuations and thermal fluctuations are an essential part of QED. So even when there's nothing in QED, it's not nothing. You have virtual photons popping in and out of existence all over the place. Um, and these are, you know, also, if you have the electromagnetic field at a finite temperature, uh, these are not just virtual photons, but they're also thermal photons, which are real in some sense. And these quantum fluctuations, uh, quantum fluctuation phenomena, actually, they span a pretty broad range of physical effects all the way from the size of the universe down to the atomic scale. So this picture that you're seeing here, this is the baby picture of our universe from uh, some 300,000 years after the Big Bang. It's a cosmic microwave background. And the, the colors there represent the temperature inhomogeneities in the early universe. And uh, these uh, inhomogeneities are what led to the density perturbations and how matter was distributed and eventually how galaxies and stars and everything was formed. Um, and these, these fluctuations are ultimately attributed to quantum fluctuations in the early universe. And in some way you can think that we are all um, ultimately quantum fluctuations. So if you, you know, perhaps ask an astronomer, they would tell you that uh, we are stardust, but if you maybe ask a cosmologist, they may tell you that you're a quantum fluctuation. Uh, this is a, a nice and relevant quote from a book by Paul Davies, uh, which I like. Um, on the on somewhat more perceptible scales, there are geckos actually, and if you look at uh, how geckos stick on walls, they they have these tiny hair on their feet called setae, which can uh, which have a strong enough uh, van der Waals attraction to walls that allow them to uh, support their weight and climb on walls. And uh, this has been, this mechanism has been studied and uh, people are in fact even trying to mimic such, you know, gecko-like structures for building gloves for, you know, humans. And uh, here's a quote by the biologist who, who's been leading uh, this uh, 
Gecko uh, uh, Sete research. And I would also like to point to uh, Nicole's uh, recent blog post about this, uh, which uh, where she discusses uh, this uh, uh, connection between geckos and quantum effects. Um, on yet more smaller scale, which is where I typically roam, uh, we talk about quantum fluctuation phenomena in atoms. And um, one of the more uh, familiar phenomena in atomic systems is that if you put an atom in an excited state, it radiates and it goes down. And this spontaneous emission can be understood as being stimulated by quantum fluctuations of the electromagnetic field. And in fact, spontaneous emission, if we look around us, is responsible for most of the light uh, that we see around. So if you do a quick back of the envelope calculation, and this is something perhaps you can do as a homework if you want, uh, if you were to consider sun as an ideal black body radiator at 6,000 Kelvin or whatever the temperature of the sun is, and you calculate the ratio of the stimulated to spontaneous emission, you would find that most of the light in the visible spectrum is due to spontaneous emission, okay? Um, so quantum fluctuations or fluctuations in general are important to our existence. I think we've established that which is why we should uh, care about them a little more, okay? And uh, so here's what I'm gonna talk about. So since, you know, this is slightly away from quantum thermodynamics, I wanna give a flavor for what uh, quantum fluctuation effects are all about and how they become uh, interesting and uh, in, in new ways in nanoscale quantum systems. Um, so the first two, uh, 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 say topics are going to be a bit more um, on the slides and the next uh, when we will get down to business uh, when we talk about atom field interactions um, in the presence of media and we will describe these interactions in terms of an open quantum system uh, approach using master equations okay so we'll see how far we get today uh, but I'm hopeful so let's start. All right, so uh, quantum fluctuation forces or fluctuation forces again more generally uh, arise between two perfectly neutral objects. So think about you know two objects A and B, uh, no charges involved and that are separated by the vacuum, okay? That's my vacuum cleaner. And uh, as uh, these objects interact, there are spontaneous fluctuations in the tiny dipoles that make each of these neutral bodies. And there are spontaneous fluctuations in the electromagnetic field that separates these neutral bodies, okay? And these, uh, uh, as these dipoles interact with the fluctuations uh, and, in, and, and uh, you know, mediate interactions between objects A and B, we get some, resulting forces. So in other words, you get an energy that depends on uh, the separation uh, because of such interaction processes. We will derive this in more careful detail as we go, but at least this picture and animation gives you a feeling for what these effects microscopically come from. And these forces that come about, they go by different names depending on what's the shape, size, geometry of the object and who originally happened to discover them. So if you're talking about, you know, two point like particles, we typically refer to them as London or Van der Waals. Um, if it's a gecko, you call it Van der Waals. If you're talking about two more macroscopic objects, like two perfectly conducting parallel plates, we call it Casimir um, and so on. And what I'm going to focus on in uh, this series of lectures is uh, uh, single particles or few particles uh, close to uh, macroscopic bodies where we will refer to these interactions as Van der Waals or Casimir Bolger. Okay. And to give you a bit more background on how this all started, we take a trip back to 1948. Um, so this is in 1948 in the Netherlands, uh, people were trying to explain why a certain colloidal suspension is stable. 
it wasn't milk, but milk is an example of a colloidal suspension. So I put that picture. But uh, the idea was that they were trying to explain why is it that you have two particles in a colloid that are separated by a typical distance that you can measure, which is, let's say, R. And uh, what what was found was that the um, the, the interparticle forces, if they were to scale according to the quasi-static uh, London or Van der Waals theory, these forces would go as one over R to the six, okay? Uh, but one over R to the six doesn't explain, one over R to the six forces, or rather, sorry, one over R to the six potentials would lead to forces that are too strong and attractive that all these particles should come together and not be suspended in a colloidal form. What Casimir and Polder did at the time was to include a, uh, formulate this problem in terms of QED, include retardation effects of the electromagnetic field. And that, uh, including that gives you a one over R to the seven scaling, which explains the uh, you know observation of a colloidal suspension, whatever it was, being stable. So uh, the, the whole uh, you know, problem kind of came from a sort of mundane question of trying to explain stability of colloidal suspension. And uh, it led to some very uh, interesting insights about the nature of QED and, and more. In, in, however, in explaining this, what you can also see is that if you didn't have a finite speed of light, yes. Is it the nature of 3D, was this calculation a quantum calculation? It was a quantum calculation. Yeah. yeah. And, and are we talking about room temperature at the room temperature colloid? Uh, uh, the, yes, this was a room temperature colloid. The calculation in the original Casimir Boulder paper, the one that I have uh, displayed here, uh, was that they uh, expanded the electromagnetic field in a box with, uh, well, I, I don't remember if they included finite temperature effects or not, but the scaling of one over R to the six and one over R to the seven, um, that they did explain in that paper. And uh, the field was considered to be quantized in a box and uh, uh, and they in in that quantized field mediated interactions found the interparticle forces. Does that answer your question? In so in terms of okay, nature of QED. So the after this work uh, came the work of uh, the paper of Casimir. So apparently Casimir was taking a walk with Niels Bohr. And he mentioned to Bohr, you know, this idea of uh, uh, having, um, uh, you know, discovered these Casimir border forces. And Bohr said something about zero point energy, which led Casimir to formulate this problem in a different setting. So here's the paper, the famous, famous paper of Casimir, which is what the, Casimir effect is named after. It's actually just two and, and a little bit of a half a page afterwards. And if you're interested in it, I strongly encourage you to read it. It's you can even take this as a homework exercise. Actually, it's not. It's a, it's a really fun paper. Um, and what Casimir formulated in this paper was basically to consider two perfectly conducting parallel plates and look at the energy density of the electromagnetic field. Uh, with and without these boundaries being present. So what uh, what Bohr suggested to Casimir about you know the zero point energy of the quantum electromagnetic field came after this whole discussion of trying to explain colloidal uh, why colloidal suspensions are stable. So it, it, in a sense that it, it, it inspires one to take you know the simplest problems seriously and dig deeper. So that's my takeaway from that. Um, uh, that story, um, right? So, so this is actually a very neat exercise that you can do. Uh, as soon as uh, you quantize the electromagnetic field, 
you can write the energy of the vacuum electromagnetic mold. So electromagnetic field now being in its vacuum state. And you can sum the total zero point energy with and without the boundaries being present. And the difference in these two energies is uh, dependent on the separation between these boundaries, it turns out, unsurprisingly. And if you look at how this uh, energy difference varies as a function of the separation A, you can see uh, that there's a force. Obviously, if there's a energy that depends on separation, that leads to a force. And this force is typically attractive. And this is what we refer to as a Casimir force. Um, if you want to see some typical numbers, so in Casimir, uh, in his paper, uh, as he wrote that the effect is small and the experimental confirmation may not be unfeasible. Um, and might be of certain interest. It has certainly be of, uh, it has been of significant interest since uh, 1948 and it, it continues to be of interest uh, even now. Um, but to get, you know, a sense of the magnitude of these forces, how small they are, you can plug in some typical numbers. So imagine that you have two, uh, these two plates are a centimeter by a centimeter separated by a micron or so you get a force of something like 0.0139, which is a number I have no feelings for. So if you don't either, you can uh, think that this is about, you know, thousandth of uh, the weight of a, a housefly, okay? Now, since Casimir, uh, there have been attempts at experimental observation of this effect, and it has been indeed observed. The early efforts were in the 1950s where, um, uh, people tried to look at this with uh, metallic plates and with spheres and plates. As you can see uh, from Sparney's paper here, the uh, as uh, he underlines that the observed attractions, the error bars were so large that all uh, this paper could say is that it doesn't disagree with Casimir's original prediction. But since then, we've certainly come a long way. In late 90s, there were significant uh, developments in, um, in precision, precision measurements of forces. Uh, and we, we have, uh, Casimir forces have been measured and tested uh, and they fall you know, uh, in, in the theoretically predicted range as one expected. Casimir uh, forces have also been measured with atoms, which is this last paper um, here. And uh, this is uh, uh, now becoming increasingly relevant. These atom surface interactions become more and more relevant as we now move towards nanoscale systems. So, which is what I want to get to next. So the idea of uh, Casimir, uh, where you, know, you think of two boundaries confining the electromagnetic field, and then you look at how these can, how this confined electromagnetic field um, changes in its zero point energy uh, is, well, the, I, I wanna say also that this is something you can think of from a thermodynamic perspective if you want. So you, what you're thinking about in that case is that there is a photon gas which has some free energy with and without boundaries and the whole problem can be formulated equivalently in a thermodynamic picture, okay? Um, now what we are, however, as we go towards nanoscales, shrink these systems down, in particular, as our systems become quantum, we are considering these boundaries to be quantum in some way, as in they can exist in superpositions, they can exist in entangled states. Um, and uh, then the question becomes, how do you describe all these fluctuation forces and other fluctuation induced effects at these uh, scales and in these quantum systems in particular. So the, the two sort of you know, motivating factors why you may want to think about this is because uh, such nanoscale quantum systems are relevant to many up and coming uh, quantum technological applications. And the other thing is that 
we are now thinking about doing Casimir physics where these Casimir plates have now become quantum in some way. And uh, that inspires us to think in terms of uh, what does a uh, what does it mean for a boundary condition to be in a quantum superposition or in a entangled state and things like that. Okay. Um, which brings me to the next chapter of nanoscale quantum systems. And in particular, when I'm talking about nanoscale quantum systems, I'm thinking of atoms or collections of atom-like objects close to a macroscopic body um, and interactions between atoms and photons are important to many of these you know, quantum up and coming uh, quantum information and quantum metrology uh, uh, devices. But these atom-photon interactions are also very weak. So you can see that actually from um, uh, writing this dimensionless coupling strength between the atoms and photons. So what I've written here, this is the vacuum Rabi coupling. So as we've seen in Ferdinand's lecture, uh, the Rabi coupling with laser field, this is Rabi coupling to a vacuum field, if you think about it. And you can actually do a back of the envelope calculation. So if you write, you know, just using the Bohr model of the atom, uh, the, the dipole moment associated characteristically would scale as the electronic charge times the uh, radius of the electron. Uh, you can write the quantized electromagnetic field strength to be uh, the, the per photon quantized electromagnetic field strength if you quantize the field in a vacuum. Uh, this is something like that. And if you plug these expressions in, what you can quickly see uh, after a quick uh, uh, back of the envelope calculation is that this object, this dimensionless ratio is small. And it's Primarily, it's small because there's a fine structure constant sitting up there. And the fine structure constant being small is what limits the strength of light matter interaction overall, right? However, what you would also notice is that there's hope. In the denominator, you can see that there's a factor of volume, which uh, comes from this per photon electric field strength appearing in the uh, E there, divided by lambda naught, um, uh, actually this should be raised to the three halves. Uh, no, no, that's right, V over lambda cube, sorry. Yeah, so obviously what this tells us that if we can confine our electromagnetic fields in smaller and smaller volume, we can enhance the light matter interaction strength. And that is precisely what these nanoscale quantum systems do, okay? Uh, nanoscale quantum systems come in various shapes, uh, sizes being still nanoscales. And uh, these are a few characteristic examples of these kinds of systems. They've been experimentally realized in some cases by butterflies, as you can see. Um, and they're also useful for applications in, in many developing uh, 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 areas. Yes, exactly. Right. Good. Thank you. So butterflies wings have a photonic crystal structure. Um, butterflies are not trapping atoms to my knowledge, uh, but I, I put the photonic crystal structure there, uh, you know, to uh, sort of compare with the kind of photonic crystal structures people are trapping near atoms. Uh, so, uh, and they're also, you know, um, useful for structuring. So, well, what is a photonic crystal? It is a structure where you make a periodic refractive index of in a way that you allow for certain frequencies of light to propagate and certain frequencies to not. And uh, um, I don't know if anyone has done any detailed photonic measurements on butterfly wings, but uh, they have photonic crystal structures. So, yeah. Um, okay, right, so nanoscale quantum systems are, are cool and uh, they're also practical because you can 
think that if you go to a typical quantum optics lab, there's a jungle of big bulky optical instruments um, and you want to shrink things down to the size of a chip. But if you do that, you inevitably run into atom surface interactions at nanoscales. And that is where these quantum fluctuation effects become important. Um, and to see now, uh, why these quantum fluctuation phenomena are relevant at uh, distances of nanoscales, we can, again, draw a cartoon uh, picture and we can think about it from the perspective of dimensional analysis. So here, what I have is a dipole staring into a mirror at some distance z. And if I were to write the interaction potential for this uh, atomic dipole, um, from image theory considerations, I know that it has to scale as one over z cubed, right? There's, that's that's the scaling. Um, now the only length, sorry, the only energy scale, as far as the interaction between the dipole and the vacuum field is concerned, is h bar gamma zero, where gamma zero is the rate at which, is the spontaneous emission rate of this atom. And, this isn't quite the right dimension still, so you can see that we need a length scale here. And uh, any guesses on what the length scale might be? Is there a meter stick that this atom has? Um, not the Compton wavelength. So Compton wavelength would be relevant if you were scattering, right? Uh, this atom is radiating or it's interacting via radiation, what might be a relevant length scale in that case. It's transition wavelength, right? So uh, the only meter stick that this atom has is whatever its transition wavelength is considering, for example, it's a two level atom. And if I plug that in the denominator, you are actually very close to the uh, gasimir boulder shift of a two-level atom in the near field regime near a perfect conductor. So uh, a dimension, uh, you know, a dimensional analysis argument can be quite useful here to understand these quantum fluctuation mediated interactions. And actually, if you think about it, the separation here is 2z. So I could have added a factor of two in the denominator, which leaves me just a factor of half. And I can sort of argue my way uh, around that as well, because I can say that a virtual photon is kind of like half a real photon, if you, if you believe that. So, so right, so that, that gives you the, the uh, expression for the casimir polder potential uh, for, for a two-level atom near a perfect conductor. Now you can plug in some typical numbers because we know, um, you know, for example, if, if you think about the workhorse of a lot of AML physics is the rubidium atom. Uh, and if you plug in the numbers for the rubidium D2 transition, uh, the corresponding gamma zero and the wavelength, uh, you can see that this potential strength at distances of tens of nanometers it overpowers most of our ways of trapping and um, controlling signal particles uh, using external electric and magnetic fields. So we need to come up with some ways. If, if you want to go to that regime, so you don't have to, but you would like to because going closer to uh, the surface of a waveguide is beneficial. You get strong light matter interactions there. But if you go there, you run into these considerations and that is something we would like to be able to engineer, okay? And here's a picture which shows the typical uh, near surface traps that exist. And this is a cluster, you know, here around 100 nanometers or so, uh, where uh, people have been able to trap particles, but below 100 nanometers, uh, these fluctuation forces seriously overpower your, uh, uh, you know, trap strengths, and it is no longer possible to stably trap a particle if we just get attracted to a surface. Okay. Which is why we should care, uh, perhaps. And uh, in fact, what's 
what's more interesting is that these atoms that you're trapping, they are quantum systems in themselves. So we may be able to leverage their quantum properties uh, to control these fluctuation forces as a separate norm than what we have otherwise used for controlling fluctuation forces with more macroscopic bodies. And for that purpose, we can take an open quantum systems point of view. So how do you control these uh, fluctuation induced effects? So here, uh, my collection of atoms or whatever quantum system of interest I have is my system now in the open quantum system picture, which is interacting with a bath. The bath for us would be the electromagnetic field. Uh, and the bath has the density of moles or you know spectral density, whatever you want to call it, which is shaped by the presence of a certain boundary condition. Okay. And as these two interact, meaning the system and the bath interaction leads to uh, your various fluctuation and use phenomena, which are all describable within a master equation-like approach as we will do. So if you ascribe a density matrix to your system, rho S, um, you can derive a corresponding master equation, uh, d rho over dt, which has some um, Hamiltonian part and uh, a Liouvillian part, uh, the, the Lindbladian uh, part, which uh, the wherein the Hamiltonian will correspond to your energy shifts and forces, and the dissipation and the coherence are derived from the uh, dissipator. Yeah, uh, that that is what we would like to do. And in such a picture, you can see that you can you you have several knobs in order to control all these various fluctuation phenomena. So. You can change the density of modes by changing your surface optical properties, its geometry, et cetera. Uh, you can directly modify the system bath coupling. So one example would be to use, for example, magnetic interactions instead of electric dipole interactions. You can use external drives because it's a quantum system, we're allowed to do that. You can drive the system with a laser uh, to go to some interesting non-equilibrium steady state. And because also it's a quantum system, you can use correlations and uh, superpositions and, and the more quantum things about the state of your system to, again, modify these fluctuation phenomena. So this is at the confluence of uh, you know, fluctuation phenomena in QED, where we study how do QED effects get modified in the presence of uh, macroscopic boundaries. And uh, open quantum systems, where we try to understand a quantum system uh, that is, you know, driven and dissipative, uh, possibly in any body, and combining these two uh, is what we will try to do in this lecture, in this series of lectures. And on the one side, when we talk about the QED uh, uh, effects in the presence of media, we will talk about what do quantized electromagnetic fields look like in near media? Uh, this falls under the framework of macroscopic quantum electrodynamics. Um, don't worry about the names. Whatever the names there are, we will we will go through whatever the concepts, underlying concepts behind these things are. And the other side, which is when we describe the open system dynamics of these quantum systems, uh, we will use a master equation approach which uh, you may be perhaps more familiar with, okay? And uh, I wanna mention that these ideas we've used for a range of problems. So if you're interested in any of these questions, uh, I'm happy to chat. You can also chat with Clemens who's right there. Uh, Clemens is, uh, I would say, delocalized between the, the fluctuation induced decoherence and Brownian motion and the uh, shaping interparticle uh, potentials using external drives uh, set of problems. So for for today, though, I will mostly focus, well, not today, but in this series of lectures, I will mostly focus on the, the ideas of, you know, many, many body atomic systems uh, in the presence of uh, media. Okay. And, and 
and how do we understand the open quantum system dynamics of these many body systems near media um, uh, and control those fluctuation effects. Okay, so this now brings me to the actual stuff. Um, how do we describe atom field interactions near, near different uh, surfaces? So we will start with a toy model. Here we have a, a system of N two level atoms, which we will refer to as our system. I'm going to assume that they're um, each at some same distance from the surface for simplicity. It doesn't have to be the case, of course. They're all interacting uh, with the electromagnetic field. And this interaction, again, for simplicity, I'm going to assume happens near a nice, planar semi-infinite medium. So as vanilla as possible, okay? Um, now I can write the total Hamiltonian describing this system, which is I've got my atoms, which is uh, the system of interest, uh, the field. And you can see that in this Hamiltonian for the field, this little depiction, I have included the surface as well, okay? And the idea is that we are going to describe the quantized field, including the presence of the medium. So this is in a way a um, normal mode description of the electromagnetic field that arises near some material object, okay? And then of course the atom and the field interact. So uh, if you start with writing the atomic Hamiltonian, Let's see, this is visible, right? Okay, um, I wanted to preserve green for my green stencils. So I'm going to switch pen colors, hang on. Okay, so the, the and there will be greens functions coming up, uh, but let me switch to a different pen. Yeah, okay. So here we have uh, the H atoms. As we saw in Ferdinand's lecture as well, this is a sum over n uh, two level systems, sum h bar omega zero, sigma n plus, sigma n minus, right? Um, this is our atomic Hamiltonian. And uh, as you can see, this now interacts with the electromagnetic field. And the electromagnetic field, I'm going to describe this in terms of its normal modes in the presence of a medium. As in, we are not going to, um, this is not just electromagnetic field in free space, but it is aware in some sense of what the optical properties, material properties, geometry of the underlying medium uh, are, okay? So let me, write this as uh, some over frequencies and uh, so how many of you have seen quantization of electromagnetic fields in recent past uh, just show of hands briefly okay uh, or on a more regular basis, perhaps. Uh, so in that case, let me let me remind uh, you. So uh, quantized electromagnetic fields, uh, we describe uh, the electromagnetic fields in the presence of uh, some boundary conditions here where these F daggers and F are similar to your regular a operators. So if you were in free space, you would be talking about A's and A daggers that correspond to the creation and annihilation of your photons uh, of specific modes omega, and they uh, are indexed by their frequencies, um, or more specifically, K vectors, as well as their polarizations, okay? Now, what is different here is that in this uh, in this description where we have a broken translation symmetry, 
you also get a index R in addition to uh, for for the spatial uh, mode of the field. Uh, sorry, not the spatial mode of the field, rather, but it's for describing the. So if I were to, for example, apply the operator f dagger r omega to vacuum, what it gives me is a single photon or a single excitation in the electromagnetic plus matter degrees of freedom. So this is a polaritonic-like operator, if you think about it. Uh, and what it does is that it gives you an excitation at some point r and at frequency omega in uh, in space and frequency okay on the other hand you can annihilate the same photon with a f operator so very much like what happens with a's and a daggers in free space quantized electromagnetic field, you get a similar effect in the presence of medium, except that now we have these special operators, uh, which we will call as F and F dagger. So think of these as your new uh, creation and annihilation operators that are aware of the presence of the matter degrees of freedom nearby, okay? And these are bosonic. The F and F daggers are uh, bosonic operators that follow canonical commutation relation. So we, if we were to write, oops, the corresponding, um, sorry, uh, I'm simplifying here a bit because we don't need to go through all the details. So if we were to, for example, write the corresponding commutation relation between F at R omega and, uh, r prime omega prime, this is some delta function r minus r prime and delta function omega minus omega prime. So this is again very similar to what you would have in a free space like quantized electromagnetic field. Um, and uh, we will use these relations in how we carry atom field interactions uh, in the presence of medium. So now that we have quantized the field, well, or we have uh, described the quantized electromagnetic field in this, uh, in the presence of this medium, uh, we can also describe its interaction with the uh, atomic system. So the atom field interaction, as we've seen in the previous lecture, looks uh, something like this. So Again, you have n atoms in this case, which are each described by their individual dipole operators. And the quantized electric field at the position of those dipoles, okay? So each of these uh, atomic dipoles is located at some position Rn, is what I'm going to assume. And as we write this interaction, uh, there are a couple of things. So one is that this dipole operator, as we know, is some of, so this is the dipole vector, the classical dipole vector times, um, effectively a sigma x for, for the nth atom, okay? On the other hand, the electric field is now to be written in the presence of a medium. So I'm going to write this as a sum over modes uh, and sum over positions, d3r, here comes the most interesting character of the story, which is the green stencer, okay? And if you're in free space, your green stencer or the propagator for the electromagnetic field is simply a plane wave. So you go from point R to point R prime, 
and the, uh, the, the the corresponding propagator is just some e to the i k r minus r prime. However, now we have a different uh, boundary present, which tells us that there is a propagator that encodes all the information about the presence of this medium, uh, its geometry, optical properties, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'm going going to write uh, this green sensor in green specifically so that we can draw a box around it. And uh, I'll use this as an uh, ad hoc, uh, the, the green box as an ad hoc for describing propagators in, in the future equations, okay? The point here is though, that uh, as, you know, as you expand this electric field in terms of the normal modes in the presence of a medium, um, you now have these F operators plus the Hermitian conjugate. So this is, if you've seen the electromagnetic field being quantized in free space, and if you compare it with the regular expression, what we have written here, this is similar to your E to the I, K, R, N minus R, and this F operator is similar to your A, uh, A omegas, okay? So I hope that brings some comfort uh, in, in familiar uh, notations. Um, but yeah, now, now we are in a sort of different uh, territory where we need to include the presence of a material body, which is uh, being captured by this green stencil G. Um, well, it's a tensor, by the way. So let me also explain why uh, would this object be a tensor? Uh, any thoughts on that? So the thing is that this, these, I, I didn't write it very explicitly, but these fluctuations uh, can arise in any polarization, X, Y, or Z in principle, right? So I can have a fluctuating excitation in the field one way, which can create an electric field at another point in a different polarization. So the tensor nature of the Green's function takes care of that. The two indices in here, R, N, and R, tell us that this is something that is perhaps being sourced at a point R in space and is causing uh, an electric field or contributing to the electric field at position R, N. That's uh, what we see here, and, and this is similar to you know, what we have, for example, in a, in a usual um, a propagator as well. And these effects in particular are pertinent to the frequency omega of the electric field. Yeah. Uh, does the, in the greens, uh, actually, does it say R and the second one is R the There's no subscript on it. That is the one that is being integrated over. Oh. Thanks for the question. So, um, right. So this is, uh, now we can write our electric field in the presence of a surface. And again, this Green's function or Green's tensor is very convenient because it, it does all the work for us as far as uh, describing electromagnetic fields near media goals. Okay, so having written that, we can now move on to um, actually the, Green's function itself and open that up a little bit. So this Green's function uh, comes from as a solution to the Helmholtz equation. So if you write the Maxwell's equation in the presence of these boundaries, you can arrive at the uh, corresponding Helmholtz equation, which encodes whatever the space dependent permittivities and permeabil permeabilities are. And the solution to, um, to this equation tells you how would a photonic excitation go from point R to point R prime from let's say a source to uh, you know, a certain point where you're making observations um, uh, in, in, in this scenario, okay? And having uh, 
uh, knowledge of the boundary conditions. In particular, let's say if we are assuming a planar medium, uh, which is ep which is characterized by some epsilon r omega, uh, this would be something like epsilon for maybe r less than zero and uh, uh, epsilon naught for r greater than or equal to zero, okay? So all we would do is we would plug such a permittivity in the Helmholtz equation, solve this uh, uh, Helmholtz equation to obtain what this propagator is, and then we are good to go, okay? Um, this, by the way, has nothing quantum in it. So as far as the description of this propagator goes, the classical electric fields, electromagnetic fields, travel in the same way as the quantized electromagnetic fields. And uh, you can, you can um, break this into two parts, one being the free part where we consider the entire uh, you know, uh, space to be without medium. So, or in other words, you can break your Helmholtz equation into two subparts. Um, and this green tensor correspondingly has a free space and a scattering component where the free space component gives you all the things that we know happen in QED in the, in the free space, meaning spontaneous emission, lamp shifts, free space dipole-dipole interactions. All that comes from the orange stuff. Uh, and the scattering part, which explicitly includes the processes where you scatter a photon off of a medium and back, this is what gives the, the interesting uh, medium-induced effects. So here we are talking about modifications to the energy levels of atoms. If you put them near a surface, uh, how do their uh, spontaneous emission rates get modified? How does dapple-dapple interaction get modified near a surface and so on, okay? So having uh, said that, we can now, um, we are now all set with the corresponding total Hamiltonian of our system, which is that we have uh, the atoms, uh, the field, and the atom field interaction, wherein the electric field is described in terms of some uh, B3R, uh, the green tensor Rn, and uh, the new field operators, okay? Any questions so far? Yes. Oh no, I did not define that. Yes, thanks for catching. There's actually another index, which I did not talk about. So he, okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, when you're talking about the excitations that arise, in the electromagnetic field. These fluctuations can be of polarization kind as an electric or magnetization kind. And this polarization versus magnetization noise is what that lambda represents. I totally skipped that over for simplicity, but uh, it is an ingredient in, the, uh, uh, in consideration. What we will mostly, what, we, we need to uh, take from all this is that these Fs, whatever they are, with however many indices there are, they follow canonical commutation relation as an F, F dagger uh, for the same indices is one and different indices being zero. Uh, the green stancer, on the other hand, has its own, um, it is ultimately describing the response of a medium. And it therefore subscribes to linear response theory. So, which means that subscribing to linear response theory, you will have some sort of a fluctuation dissipation relation that characterizes this Green's function. And that, I, I will get to that later. So those are, so, so three, three things, as far as quantizing fields near media goes, is that there's a new set of operators in town, instead of your regular A's and A daggers, uh, there's a new propagator in town, which is what tells you how a photon propagates in the presence of some boundary condition. 
And uh, this propagator has a, it, it follows a fluctuation dissipation relation, which I can also write. Let's see. So the fluctuation dissipation relation for the corresponding green stensor is, uh, let's see, our prime omega. You will see that this actually, th these kinds of um, integrals arise organically when we start deriving atom field interaction properties. So when we get to the actual master equation derivation, uh, such a g dot g dagger will just happen for us. And you can simply, so, so what I'm saying is that you don't need to remember much other than there's a different uh, propagator. There is, that propagator follows linear response theory and the new normal modes are like any other normal modes. Uh, they're good bosonic, described by good bosonic operators following canonical commutation relations, et cetera, okay. And the other side is imaginary G, R1, oops. Sorry, let, let me write this with a little more space. That was uh, more than I wanted to erase, but G R R prime omega. is equal to So this is related to the imaginary part of the response function and uh, R1, R2, omega. Right? Um, right, so the new things in the presence of surface is one, two, and three. That's really all we need. And having uh, established that, we can now do our atom field interactions as we normally would without any surface. So what we can proceed to do, how much time do I have? Probably not enough to, okay. Uh, so in that case, I think I will take questions at this point. Yes. Uh, so the quantum part of the application of the scatter, the three, three space classical. Both are classical. So as far as describing the electromagnetic field near a medium goes, we are always talking about the classical Maxwell's equations. Uh, well, Maxwell's equations, you know, you can, you can talk about um, the, 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 what enters in the Maxwell's equations is the macroscopic response of the media, which is described by some permittivity and permeability, which are spatially dependent, uh, frequency dependent, and so on. And uh, that leads to a, a propagator, which tells you how is it that a source is going to generate a field at a certain point. This could be a quantum source, this could be a classical source, the propagator remains the same, yeah? So it could be that, so the, so the free space and the medium assisted part they're both classical and quantum. So the, the propagator is the same, as in it comes from the same Maxwell's equations. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You gave this nice derivation of uh, the uh, transition dipole with Casimir interaction with the plate. Did Casimir do that before? No, you're just reconstructing the plate. Yeah. So there was, there was no, uh, so it's one over 16. Just... Yeah, that's that's actually uh, my attempt to explain Casimir polar interactions over a beer for several years. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> the but but the argument is fine, I think, in the sense that you are uh, you can't you can't think of so so what has been known is that Van der Waals interactions can be described in terms of fluctuating dipoles. So ultimately we are thinking about dipole-dipole interactions in the near field regime, which do scale as one over R cubed. Uh, then you, um, 
if you're thinking about the characteristic strength of these dipole dipole interactions, the only uh, interaction strength as far as you know the the uh, coupling to vacuum goals is determined by your spontaneous emission rate that sets the energy scale. So I it, it is a pretty organic argument to me. Um, I haven't seen it in in exactly those words elsewhere, uh, but yeah, it makes sense. London concept of fluctuating dipoles is a one over R set, right? So, but you're you're saying something only in the transition layer, not just the fluctuating. Um, or maybe I misunderstood. So the one over R to the six interaction would be between two dipoles that are neutral like that are separate, right? Yeah. Here, the dipole is actually interacting with its image, which is perfectly correlated. So I believe it's a, it's a different physical scenario for that reason. Right, it's not a one big uh, dispersion situation. No. It's not, yeah. So, um, no, I'm just trying to make sure I understand the, if, if, but if you were using that then to imply something about the Casimir interaction between transition dipole and a flat Right. So what I was suggesting is that from these, uh, one can, from a dimensional analysis, arrive at a interaction energy that happens to be exactly what the Casimir polar potential in the near field regime looks like. That was a statement. Yeah. But for transition type. Or transition dipole with its mirror image. Transition dipole interacting with its mirror image. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's yeah. No. It, I just it's a little unclear to me because the, the London picture is not for transition dipole. Mm -mm. It's, it's over. But I I don't think there's much of a difference there. So in 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 terms of transition dipole or not, if I put a real dipole in front of a mirror. Um, but it's not permanent. There's a, it's not permanent, right. There's yeah. A there's a transit frequency. Right, so if I if I think about a, uh, a dipole, which let's say is radiating at a characteristic frequency uh, omega zero at a rate gamma zero. Uh, so, so there's some, you know, uh, characteristic strength of, let's say, dissipation. Uh, I would, from from a very classical perspective, I would say that if you put this dipole near a perfect mirror, and you calculate the interaction energy between this dipole and the mirror, that would be given by that expression also. So in in that case, there is no h bar because we are talking about the power radiated or dissipated by this dipole. Um, and uh, we would replace that instead uh, of h bar gamma zero. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay.